I'm going to speak to you on a topic called the marks of heaven. How many know that God wants to release heaven on earth? In fact, everything Jesus did was to give us a model on how to release heaven on earth. People talk about theology and they, they debate it, but Jesus is perfect theology. So if you want to know what good theology is, just follow what Jesus did. And so I begin to think about the church. I begin to think about, because the model of the church is, is the Acts church. It's not the American church. It's not the Australian church. It's not the Asian church. It's the Acts church. And that's the model. And we see in Acts chapter 2, a model of how to build church. Um, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell um, in the upper room. I, I love that, how the Holy Spirit came. They, were, they didn't even know what they were up there for, but they were in one accord. And, you know, amazing thing was they went from thousands to 120. And sometimes God has to reduce something so something can accelerate. And so... 120, the Holy Spirit filled. Then in Acts 2.42, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the eating of meals, and to prayer. And then the Bible says a great awe came upon them and the apostles performed um, many miraculous signs and wonders. How many know that we think signs and wonders create awe, but awe creates signs and wonders? We're waiting for God to do something instead of being in awe of Him. And He does things when we're in awe of Him. You know, I wrote a book called The Honour Key because I believe honour is the key to faith. If you look at everything, every miracle Jesus did, there was always honour connected to faith. And where there was no honour, there was no faith. And, you know, you can't have salvation without honour until we honour what Jesus did upon the cross we don't receive faith. So honour is the key that unlocks faith. And the word honour means to esteem, to value, to give weight to. And I talked about this a little bit last night, but what you give weight to is what you receive from. But the problem we have in the Western world, we've taught the wrong meaning of honour because we've taught honour is always a son to a father. But the honour in the Bible starts from a father to a son. If you look at the prodigal son... It was the father that honoured the son when he came home. You look at Jesus, the father honoured us by sending us Jesus. Then we honour the father by receiving Jesus, but honour starts with the father. And so many times we've taught that honour should start with the children. But if fathers and parents honour their children, their children will honour their parents. And honour is not about control. It's actually about release. The two spirits that we're dealing with in this earth is a spirit of honour or a spirit of Jezebel, manipulation, intimidation and control. And you know you can teach honour with the Jezebel spirit because you must honour me because I, I am this and I've done this for you. That's called control. Jesus never, ever, and the Father never taught us control. That's why he gave us free will. Interesting, right? And so where there is an absence of honour, control, intimidation and manipulation comes in. So if you look in our society, it's run by Jezebel, intimidation, manipulation and control. Everything is done from that spirit. But the church that deals with the spirit of Jezebel, manipulation, intimidation and control, the Bible says will be given the morning star, which is the manifest presence of God. (laughs) So we as Christians got to constantly live in a position of honouring God, honouring each other, honouring our children, honouring our leaders, honouring every part of society. And honour is not hierarchical, it's, it's everybody honours. And we never are here to honour style. I see people, you know, I've been in church a long time. I grew up with the Pentecostal two-step. I grew up... I could sing all the old songs. I could sing them to the cows come home. I, I actually like them. You know, I, I'm, I'm old enough. You know, I used to lead worship. You know, I'd sing, He Touched Me and um, How Great Thou Art. I, I love all those songs. Um, but when you have children, children keep you young. And now I, I like rap worship as well. So, <laughs> because here's the deal. People say, well, that's more anointed than that. But each generation, there's a trigger point that God touches. And so it's never about a style. It's always about a spirit. 
And so what happens is in life we receive from people we like their style. But God, if we had a, a, an idea of honour that we looked at the God in people, instead of looking at what they see on the outside, look at the potential they have on the inside and honour that because when you honour that, you actually uh, give weight to it. And when you give weight to it, you receive from it. And when you receive from it, a blessing comes. So when we look beyond the package and look into the spirit of somebody and the potential in somebody, if you look at me, you know, now I, I preach to thousands of people, millions of people actually, and, um, you know, j just Planet Shaker social media is 2.5 million people that follow us on social media, just on that. Um, and if you look at me now, you go, yeah, cool, he's bald and whatever, and God's been good. But if you saw me as a teenage, uh, very insecure, my dad was a famous pastor, and I would always see if people liked me because of me, not my dad. And so people would come up to me and, and I would just give them a hard time just to check out whether they liked me. And I remember we had this guest preacher one day and I said, why are you here? What have you ever done good that would get you here? I was very rude, but I wasn't really rude. I was hurting. And my youth pastor looked beyond my prickles and saw my potential. And I remember one time we're at a youth camp and he was crying. I said he was Italian. And uh, he's crying. And I go, why are you crying? He goes, I'm not crying. I said, yes, you're crying. He said, no, no, I'm not crying. I said, well, why is your head leaking then? Um, and, I, and, he, and he says, because God's showing me who you could be. He goes, you're going to be a history maker. And really all I'm doing right now is interpreting the dream of my youth pastor. I'm interpreting... You see, Joseph became a ruler because he interpreted everyone else's dreams. In other words, he looked to see what God had put in them to pull out what they carried. So that's just uh, a bit of entree for you. Uh, <laughs> But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word devoted means to give one enti oneself entirely to. They devoted themselves to the apostle teach apostles' teaching. And God began to speak to me and he said, there's five things in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, that if every church does, it will be a model for how a church should be built. And I said, well, okay, what's that? He said, first, the Holy Spirit needs to come for encounter. Without encounter, we are just a club. So an encounter must happen. Then they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's that? That is the vision of the church and the doctrines of the church. It's what's been taught. And so um, with Pastor Lewis here, he comes and, and brings a vision. Um, we, we don't sit there and go, well, we go, can we honour that? We're going to honour what God is saying because we've appointed a man of God. We're going to honour what he's saying for our church. Every year I get a theme for our church. And I said, this is a prophetic word for our church this year. Last year was a year of double portion, which was a year of discipleship. And our whole goal was to double our small groups. Guess what? Our leaders didn't sit back and go, oh, yeah, whatever. No, they honoured what God was saying, and we've doubled our small groups in a year. I remember a year, God said, it's a year of favour. I'm going to bring financial breakthroughs, jobs, promotions. It was the year of the global financial crisis. I said, God, that doesn't make, that make sense. Then a friend of mine came and preached in our church. His name's um, Robert Morrison. He preached a sermon called The Blessed Life. And uh, there was an impartation that happened. And our giving that year went up 75%. And at the end of the year, I said to the people in our church, who's had a job promotion? Who's had finances come in supernatural? Who's seen God do super abundantly far over and above? Who's had favour? 90% of people stood. Why? Not because I just delivered a word, but there was honour to what God was saying and, and, and through it to our church. And they took it and they ran with it. Because that's how it works. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Then they devoted themselves to fellowship. As a church, we need to not just have encounters and not just have vision, we need to come in fellowship with the vision. We need to now be part of the vision. We're, we, we are, this is our community. This is our church. This is where we work together and, and change the world together. So there's fellowship. And then they ate meals together. That speaks to me of family. 
So encounter, then I love the vision, then I come in fellowship with the vision. Now I'm family with the vision. It's my vision. It's not just Pastor Lewis's vision. It's our vision. It's our church. And then they devote themselves to prayer, intimacy and power. And I, and I said to the Lord, he said, go to Genesis. And I said, why go to Genesis? When God tells me something that's smarter, when something smarter than me comes to my head, I know it's God. <laughs> so I go to Genesis and he goes, what's the Holy Spirit doing? I said, he's hovering As in Genesis. He said, he was a part of creation. He was that Holy Spirit was a part of the creation of the universe. Of the world. He said the Holy Spirit was part of the creation of the church. Because the church is a representation of what the kingdom should look like. The Bible says we're ambassadors of God. So people view God through you. So if a church is dead and boring, guess what they're going to view God be like? Dead and boring. If a church has no miracles, guess what they're going to view God like? A God that's not real. If a church that doesn't walk in a blessing and abundance, guess what they think of God? He's a God of poverty. (laughs) So the church should represent what heaven looks like. And heaven has no lack. Our dad ain't poor, by the way. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in love. He's rich in resource. He's rich in power. There is no lack in him. He's our dad. The Bible says that in Romans that we're heirs of God, not heirs of God. I would like that. But we're heirs of God. That's an inheritor, a possessor. That doesn't mean that when I die, I, I, I get my, inher- my children don't get their inheritance from me just when I die. I've discovered when you have children, they're inheriting from you all the time. (laughs) My my son, when he was three, he was there and uh, he liked new things. He He liked science fiction. And I bought my wife a new car and we're in the petrol station. And uh, he, he says, hey, just before, a week before that, I'd taken the new car through a car wash because you wash it a lot when you first buy it. And so took it through a car wash and he's playing, I'm on the phone and he's playing with buttons and there was an electric window button that he pressed in showers of heaven. Talk about refreshing. (laughs) They came in and I refreshed him. (laughs) The next week, I'm filling up the car with petrol. He presses the button Uh, and he goes, Dad. I go, yes, Jonathan, lollipop. No problem. He goes, no, Dad, lollipop. I said, yeah, I've heard you, Jonathan. Yep, no problem. Lollipop, Dad. Yes, Jono, no worries. Lollipop. He he's, he's keeps asking me, lollipop, Dad, lollipop. I said, look, stop being like Mum. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a joke. That's not true, actually. Uh, <laughs> and so I go, no problem. Because he knows his dad's rich enough to buy him a lollipop. He knows that. So I go in to pay for the petrol and the lollipop and my three-year-old son's got out of the car, he's walked out into the shop and his hands is on his hip and he said, Dad, where's my lollipop? I said, here's my lollipop. You notice my son didn't beg and crawl and say, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not good enough, you know, I'm nobody, but please get... And a lot of Christians come to God like that. He came with boldness. Why? Because he understood who he was as a son and he understood who his dad was. He understood that his dad was rich enough to buy him a lollipop. Let me suggest to you, as easy as it was for me to buy a lollipop, it's way more easier for God to provide your healing, to provide your breakthrough, to provide your resource, to provide... He wants to bless you. And church should be a place of blessing. Because we're ambassadors. What does an ambassador do? Lives in an embassy. What's the embassy of heaven? The church. You see, when you step into the Australian embassy in another country, a third world country, you step into foreign soil. You're now in, an, you're in one nation, but you're actually in another nation, even though you're on the, the continent of Africa, you're now in Australia because you're in Australian embassy. So when people step into your vicinity, they're stepping into a heavenly vicinity. Yes, you are an Australian citizen, but you're a heavenly citizen. And now you're an ambassador 
ambassador representing the king. And they, so they step in. So wherever you are, it represents wherever heaven is. And wherever heaven is, there's no lack. Wherever heaven is, there's healings. Wherever heaven is, there's breakthroughs. And my belief is, I think the church should be the place that society comes for answers. Oh, I'm having problems in my marriage. I better go down to that ACF church because I heard the marriage is a blessing. People are getting restored and people are getting healed. Oh, I, I'm sick of my body. I'm going to go down to the ACF church because they're seeing miracles and breakthroughs. I, I don't understand, but I'm just going to ring them. I'm not a Christian, but I'm desperate. Oh, I need a job. I heard there's so many jobs at that ACF church. You just walk in there and there's faith that's happening. And so I got to get in that environment and see breakthrough. That's what, that's what I believe the church should be. It should be the centre of society. And so the Holy Spirit was at the creation of the world and also the creation of the church. Then the Bible says that they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's that? The vision and the word. Watch this. In Genesis, God said, let there be light. God said, the, what is he doing? His word and vision is being released. So the apostles' teaching and uh, the, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching was the vision of the church through the kingdom being released through doctrine and teaching. Hmm. I said, well, that's pretty good. God, I didn't ever think of that. He said, yeah, then what happened in, in creation? I said, you created Adam and the animals. He said, yeah. Man gets in, comes into fellowship with creation, but it's never family. And he said, well, I said, that's good. He said, then what did I do? I said, you created Eve. He goes, what's that? I said, that's family. He said, then what did I do? I said, you walk with them in the cool of the evening. He said, that's intimacy and power. And he said, the five things that I had in the, the beginning of creation, I have reintroduced in the beginning of the church. And if every church has encounter, vision and unity in that vision, has fellowship with the vision, has family become part of the vision and have intimacy and power. Then you'll have Acts 2, 43, 44 and 45, that signs and wonders happen, that the poor are looked after, that people are getting saved and that heaven is released. That's, that's the pattern of the church. <laughs> so anyway... I want to talk to you about the first part of it, the Holy Spirit. Everywhere Jesus is going, he's, uh, Jesus was so cool because every funeral became a party. <laughs> you know, Jesus was amazing. I, 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 loved, I looked at all the miracles of Jesus and the first miracle of Jesus, he turned water into wine. Now, if I was God, that wouldn't be my first miracle. My first miracle would have been Lazarus because that was more spectacular. Get a lot more attention. But God, what God does prophetically first is he wants to give us a picture of old wine, uh, water being turned into wine. Natural becomes supernatural. He leaves the best to last. The latter rain will be greater than the former rain. He takes our shame that's at the wedding. We've run out and he brings honour and they're going, well, wow, this is the best wine we've ever had. And God gives a picture of what the church is going to be. <laughs> and so... The Holy Spirit, Jesus is operating, seeing miracles, seeing signs, wonders, seeing the deaf healed, seeing, seeing uh, situations change. And it, it's pretty amazing what God is doing through Jesus. And, and then one day he sits his disciples down in, in John chapter 14 and he says, yo, what's up? That's my, um, my uh, young people talk right there. It's me trying to be cool. Um, what, hey, I just want you to know I'm going away. No way, Jesus. And I'm going to send somebody who represents me. And he'll lead you into all truth. And he'll be your comforter. And he'll be your counsellor. And he'll represent heaven on earth, basically. That's what he's telling them. Because Jesus was representing the Father. And now Jesus says, and by the way, even greater shall you do. Now, Jesus... How can you do greater than raise a dead person? He wasn't saying the quality of miracle was going to be greater. He was, going to, he was saying the quantity of miracles will be greater. <laughs> because 
If every one of us, you see people, I have people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Am I supposed to be a lawyer? Am I supposed to be a doctor? What's my calling? I said, I tell you your calling. And go, what, what's that? Because I'd get a dollar for every time somebody says that, I'll be a multi-squillionaire. What's my calling? I don't know my calling. I don't know my purpose. I tell you your purpose. What's that? They sit there. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. <laughs> cure the lepers. Freely as you've received, freely give. They're like, yeah, but I th- think I want to be a lawyer. I said, yeah, be a lawyer who heals the sick, who raises the dead, who casts out demons. <laughs> this is the oppressed separate. Oh, yeah, but I want to be a doctor. Yes, be a doctor who heals the sick, raises the dead. Oh, but I want to be a social worker. Yes, be a social worker. That's your vocation. Your calling is heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. <laughs> They're like, okay. <laughs> and so he says, I'm going away. I'm going to send somebody who represents me. Remember in Luke 11, he taught them how to pray. What did he pray? Teach them how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Notice he didn't say our, the prayer is our problem here on earth. A lot of us start our prayer lives, God, please. And he's going, you know, you got it the wrong way. Just put your focus on me. Be, you're awesome, God. You're magnificent. My, my mother, we're missionaries in Papua New Guinea. I just went back to the place where I was born. And I'm like, how did I even live? <laughs> Honestly, the hospital, you wouldn't even call it a hospital. You'd call it a hope to be alive, Bill. <laughs> it wasn't a hospital. Um, in fact, the, when I went there just recently, they said cholera had broken out and I couldn't go to the toilet in the hospital. This is the hospital. And I was born there. I was born, in, when I was born, there was 187 tremors and earth, uh, little earthquakes that happened when I was born. God's got a sense of humour. What I've done in the natural, I'll do in the supernatural. I'll call you a planet shaker. I bore you to be a planet shaker and now I'm going to make you a planet shaker. <laughs> and so I went to the house where my mum and my dad, my dad had built and I was raised in for the first two years of my life and my mother got sick and she had hepatitis and in the middle of the night a snake came in her room and so she screamed and my five foot ten father went in there and he, he killed the snake. I was impressed with that. That's pretty, the spirit of Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee came over and I was like, <laughs> And he killed her. But my mother had a nervous breakdown. And we had to come back to Australia. My mother was in a mental institution for in and out for the first period of time. My dad got asked to take over a church in Adelaide. Did that. A church of 150 became 100 overnight. Church growth in reverse. And, uh, and in that season, my mum had massive depression. She'd have people pray for her and nothing would happen. My mum's a strong person. Trust me, I've experienced that. Um, <laughs> and uh, so was Tim, right? He's, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, that's true. Um, and so she was depressed. And she said, God, I don't know the answer. And he said, praise me. She goes, how can I praise you? I, I, how can I praise you for this feeling? He says, praise me in all things. So she'd get up in the morning. Oh, God, I praise you. I thank you. You're good. I come in your courts with thanksgiving. I bless your name. You are awesome. And she'd say for the first 10 minutes, it was like chewing chips. It was hard. But after 10 minutes, this heaviness lift because God gives us garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And she'd walk the rest of the day depression free. Next morning, it would be back. Oh God, I thought we dealt with this yesterday, but I praise you and I honour you and I worship you. And she did this for two years. And I would hear her. And uh, after two years, she was in a meeting and this evangelist was there and he said, the Holy Spirit's here, ready, catch. And she goes, and the whole 2,000 people fell under the power of God. And she was at the bottom of the pile. And, and for three days, she was drunk in the spirit. She, she was driving home and she goes, oh, please don't pull me over. And she's laughing. Right? Um, but she totally got set free. But God taught her a pattern of praise. And for the rest of her life, she praised. 
I would hear her when I was a backslidden teenager. Oh God, I praise you. I thank you for my son and my other son, Ashley. They're going to serve God. I thank you, your anointings upon them. I thank you, your hands upon them. And she would praise. I'd be embarrassed and I'd be a little bit annoyed. Will you be quiet? But she would praise. Planet Shakers is known for its praise. Where did I learn that? I learned it by hearing my mum. You see, you come with the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, you're awesome. And then you get to the kingdom. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. By the time you get to give us this day our daily bread, you've got it sorted because now you're in faith. You're not living in fear. You're not living in the prospects of situation. You now have a heavenly view. So Jesus would have taught them to pray. So they're in the upper room. What would they pray? Let your kingdom come. The Holy Spirit comes. See, if I was the devil, I'd take the Holy Spirit out of the church because that would take the kingdom out of the earth. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit came and he, he released his power, came upon them, tongues of fire. And in a moment, 3,000 were added to the church. And we were birthed that day, supernaturally. And the Holy Spirit there is for every one of us so that we could do even greater than Jesus did. In other words, our impact can be greater. You know, as I said last night, in one service, in one week, on Saturday, Sunday, we have 150,000 watching us online. That is greater impact in one day than Jesus would have had in one day. It's amazing what Jesus is, is doing. But I, I want to just clo- um, briefly finish with this. The Holy Spirit, there's signs for the Holy Spirit all through Scripture. Wherever He goes, He leaves a mark. If you look at the signs for the Holy Spirit, the the word mark means to leave an impression. It it means to to have a visible mark that is left. And and so, sorry, I've got to get, I've actually gone away from my notes, but I'm back. One of the signs for the Holy Spirit is fire. Wherever the fire goes there's a mark left remember the Victorian fires that happened I went there a few years later and there was no fire but I could see the marks of where the fire had been where you at where you go do you leave a mark for where the fire of God has been 1996 I'm sitting in the front of a meeting and Ronnie Aaron Brown comes over me goes I brand you with fire in his South African I sort of did an American accent there but uh yeah. <laughs> um, Pastor Tim does South African Af- accents way better than me. And the fire of God came upon me. A, a few months before I was in a meeting in Adelaide, 10,000 people. And uh, prominent, I'm a prominent youth leader in the city. We were running big events. And in the middle of the service, I felt to run around the building. Now that's not cool. Youth pastors don't do that. So I turned to my wife and I said, I feel like running around the building. And I knew there were critics in the building of these meetings. And and I'm like, she goes, well, you better do what God tells you to do. And I'm like, well, you go and sit in that chair over there. I'm wanting you not to come into agreement with that. I want you to say that's stupid. (laughs) And so I'm sitting there and I'm I'm holding the seat. And I'm closing my eyes and I feel to run. And the preacher comes up and he goes, Run! So I got out of my seat and ran around the building. I ran around the building and I get back to my seat. My wife goes, what did you feel? I said, nothing. (laughs) Stupid. (laughs) After the service, I had a lineup of people. The first one was a critic. Why'd you run around the building? You look stupid. I went, yeah, thank you. (laughs) Next person, why'd you run around the building? You look silly. (laughs) Next person, critic again. Then the next person, fourth person, I knew this person. They said, Russell, you don't know me. But I, I, I knew this person, sorry. It's Russell, you know me. I was sitting up there. And God gave me a vision of you taking fire to the nations. I went, awesome. Next person. Russell, you don't know me. I was sitting there, but as you ran around the building, God showed me you taking fire to the nations. Next person. Russell, God showed me you taking fire to the nations. Next person. I had a vision that God showed me, you're taking fire to the nations. All we're doing now 
is leaving a mark with the fire of God. Because where his fire is, it leaves a mark. Water leaves a mark. We talk about refreshing. This weekend is about being refreshed. Well, water leaves a mark. I used to have a swimming pool in our house. (laughs) And I'd say to my children, make sure you dry before you come inside. Yes, Dad. Make sure. And they think I'm dumb. I come home and I see watermarks everywhere. Have you been in the pool? Uh, You have. I can see where the marks have been. Have you been in the presence? Because where you're in the presence, you can see wherever the marks of the presence of God has been. It makes you a different person. You're friendlier. You're more forgiving. You pray for people. You care for people. You're generous. You see, once you've been in the presence of God, I've never seen somebody touched by the power of God go, we can't. (laughs) When the presence of God comes, Holy Spirit. The Bible says in, in John 7, 37, anyone who is thirsty must come to me. And he, by the way, he did this at the end of the, the festival. And he says, anyone who believes in me must come and drink. For the scripture declares rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he was speaking of living waters, he was speaking of the Spirit. If you've been filled with the Spirit, you leave a mark. Then the wind of the Spirit, we hear the the sound of of a mighty rushing wind. Wind leaves a mark. You can't see it, but you can see the marks that it leaves. You know, I used to live at Wonga Park and we had all these trees. And and when it would become windy, all the leaves would fall into the pool. I would hate the wind because it would make me do more work. I couldn't see the wind, but I could see what it did. The wind of the Spirit. I remember I was going to a youth camp and, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and he says, I want you to, there's five people in this youth camp, I want you to blow on them. I'm like, God, that's Benny Hinn's job. That's not mine. I'm not, again, that's not super cool. And he gave, I hadn't, there was two, three hundred people in this camp. I only knew one person, the youth leader. I t- I'm driving in the car with my wife and I said, oh, God told me to blow on people. She goes, you, well, you should do it. And I'm like, no way, it's not cool. You're not funny and you're not... You know, and, uh. So I get to the camp and the vision, my vision's right before me. All the people I've seen in my vision, the five people that he told me to pick out have like, got these sort of look like, pick me, pick me, pick me. If you have children and you have ever had the Shrek DVD, the, the author, the the place where all the the chapters are they go pick me pick me it was like that and so I'm like so I pulled the five out I said everyone close your eyes because I didn't want anyone watching this (laughs) young person young man I know what you've been thinking this week close your eyes in Jesus name so I'm there and he goes I want you to breathe upon them the spirit of God by faith I'm like my breath isn't good Lord (laughs) so I go he goes, that's, that's not, I do a proper one. And I, and I had my eyes closed. I went, and I heard thud, 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 thud. I opened my eyes and all the camp was under the power of God. And for three to four hours, I just sat on the stage and wept. No one moved. God did things beyond what we could even dream about. Because where his spirit goes, the wind leaves a mark. And the last thing, oil. Every year I used to, well, when I was in Bible college, my, I got prophesied over me that, that God was going to dip my feet in oil. And wherever I go, I would leave a mark of his presence. <laughs> And I, my kids were in a Christian school down at Churnside. And uh, the chapel services were really boring. Honestly, they were. If I was a young person, I wouldn't go for God with a chapel service like that. I'm just being real. Just being real. And, uh, and my daughter was about eight and my son was a ten. And um, I would get, at the beginning of this year, I said, I'm going to anoint you with oil. And the oil has no power in it, but the anointing does. 
And I said, I'm anointing you with oil because oil represents ministry. They anointed priests to minister. But they also anointed a king to be ruler. And so I'm anointing you to be a leader in your school and be a minister in your school. And I said, I feel so much more anointed for that. Thank you. He was like, you're struggling with the anointing. Quick, get up there. Uh, have you known? Stop for a sec. Stop for a sec. Have you? Uh, yeah, okay. Jesus is Lord. That sounds good. Now, could you play for us? Jesus is Lord. <laughs> the anointing is so much better now. <laughs> that was good. Um, so I anointed with oil. And the power of God came upon my daughter. She was like shaking under the power of God. And my son, he was trying to not cry because he was 10. The tear just ran down there in the presence. They laid hands on Sam and I, anointed us to be leaders. And uh, about three months into the school year, the chaplain rings me and he says, I've been watching your daughter in worship and she's such a great worshipper. Do you mind if we get her to lead the senior school chapel? Because they need to learn how to worship. I said, sure. So I went in there, hid at the back and saw my eight-year-old daughter lead the senior school. Come on, we're going to praise God. Lift your hands, shout to God. And they're all jumping and shouting. And I'm sitting there going, wow, what had happened is we had anointed them. To leave a mark. <laughs> you know, God anoints you. The Bible says you're kings and priests. <laughs> the Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke. But in the old days, in the Old Testament, in the old traditions, they would also anoint guests into the house as a sign of honour, of acceptance. Do you know the Holy Spirit has anointed you because He says, I've accepted you. I honour you because you came into my house and honoured me. And so wherever you go, God wants you to leave a mark of His presence. But if, if you don't keep getting oil. See, I, if I had an illustration, I'd have a tray of oil and I'd get people to dip their hand and you'd put a piece of um, paper and you'd see the marks. At the beginning, it would be real strong. But the further you'd go, the less it would leave. And it would eventually run out. Why? Because I stopped dipping my feet. And refreshing really is about not just for you, so that wherever you go, oh, where have you been? Jesus I was with um, Ryan Habonke in Denver airport I had bad jet lag and I, and I said Reinhard we honour you because he was coming to Plant Shakers conference and he said all glory to Jesus I said Reinhard we honour you he goes all glory to Jesus I said, yeah, I know, but we honour you. Oh, glory to Jesus. And I'm like, yes, I know that, but we honour what God is doing through you. Oh, glory to Jesus. He says to me in the conversation, you know, I've had a lot of criticism in my life, but I don't care because I'm not looking for man's praises, so I don't worry about their criticisms. And then... He gets up. Can we do that song, um, Holy Spirit, You're Welcome Here? Is that, can we do that? Is that all right? I'm just preparing you so you... Unless you've got to do the transpose button or you can play the flats. And it's, okay, cool. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I was there and we were talking. And he goes, that some person in Africa was talking about giving him, a, making a statue of him. He goes, I don't want a statue. I want souls, souls, souls. My jet lag disappeared in a second. I was like, 
the waiter was trying to serve us. I want souls. And they're like, (laughs) everyone's watching us. And I'm like, (laughs) but here's a man who just carries authority. Just talking to him, shifts. Why? I rang him one morning because I served on his board and it was 4 a.m. And I'd hear this worship music in the background. I'd go, what's that? He goes, oh, that's just my worship time. I spend the first two hours of the day seeking God. (laughs) Why? Because he knew the key of leaving a mark was to be refreshed in the oil of God, in the wind of the Spirit, in the fire of God, in the water of God. And you're here in this place and and we've got 10 minutes to do this, which is good. Because God doesn't need three hours. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have long prayer sessions and little results. Jesus' prayer sessions were beforehand and he said, come out. He didn't have three hours trying to rebuke a demon. Well, let's get the, the, the person to repeat this scripture to get them free. No, just speak to it. Get out. Bam. See ya. <laughs> just a little thought. <laughs> but his touch, his fire, his glory, he's in his presence. And you say, I, I just need to be refreshed by God. I, I need the oil of God. Who is it? I need the power of God. I, I need, not just for me. Although I love it when He he comes and touches me and heals me and and ministers to me, but so that I can be a priest and a king. 